In case you miss it, here's a sports animal rewind. Time right now to bring in. First time we've had an opportunity to have him on the show. Former general manager of the Denver Broncos. He's now an analyst for the NFL Network. Has a terrific, very informative website called thefootballeducator.com. He also have a, has a book that we'll talk about coming up in just a little bit called Taking Your Team to the Top, How to Build and Manage Great Teams Like the Pros. Pleased to be joined by NFL Network analyst Ted Sunquest, who joins us here on the show. Hey, Ted, Vince Ferrara and Mike Strange here in Knoxville, Tennessee. How you doing, Ted? I'm doing and great fellas it's uh it's a little snowy out here in denver today <laughs> believe it or not uh, we've decided to just skip over spring and we'll start summer here in a couple of weeks yeah it's, <laughs> it's a, crazy yeah but by the way we're, not to rub it in but we're in shorts here today yeah i was afraid of that <laughs> i was two days ago believe it or not this morning i had my ski park on so <laughs> how about that well ted it, it, you did a great job in, in breaking down the draft and the prospects and, and you have such a unique vantage point having been the general manager of now peyton manning's denver broncos out there and we'll get to that in a minute but um just your your thoughts on the the first round draft pick for tennessee we'll go by one by one with these tennessee guys what did you think about the Vikings making the move to go get Cordero Patterson? What did you think about the move first, and what do you think about the player in Patterson? Well, Minnesota, you know, had the luxury of having those two first-round picks, and it was interesting to see that, uh, you know, I thought they maximized their their leverage that they had there. And going after Patterson, they certainly needed some help uh, in that receiver core. They'd gone out and gotten Greg Jennings in, in free agency, but you can't do it with just one guy. And we've said all along throughout the build-up to the draft as we broke down each team, the very per- first place that we started was with quarterback. If you've got one, you better do everything that you can possibly do to support him. If you don't have one, you better find a way to get one fast. And so that's exactly what they did. They've, Christian Ponder came on there towards the end of the season. They're not going to be able to ride Adrian Peterson in that running game uh, and go deep into the playoffs. They're going to have to be able to throw the football. And I know that's probably what Rick Spielman uh, and Leslie Frazier were thinking. Let's go get us a dynamic, uh, big-time playmaker. And Cordero Patterson is just that. Now he's on the come. This is a guy who hasn't played a lot of football, and you guys know that. And so you know, some fans may be saying, well, wait a minute. Why wasn't he taken up there around Tavon Austin or a little bit higher as he was projected? And I think it... As an evaluator, as you start breaking down his game, it does come to some of the little nuances. It's sometimes not what you do, but how you do it. And as you break it down a little bit, he is short arm when it comes to a frame and the ball comes into his body a little bit. Uh, he's an explosive, make-you-miss type guy in the open field, uh, but you got to kind of get him the ball on the move. I, you know, I, Some people disagree with me on this. I don't see a short area make-you-miss make you wiggle guy. I see a guy that once he's on the move, uh, has that explosive burst to get by you. So there's some, some things that need to be cleaned up in his game, but his ceiling is so high that the Vikings at that particular point probably felt like there's no way that we can pass on this guy. He's a weapon for our offense, and let's go get him. Ted, we heard a lot about the Wonderlick test with him and Tavon Austin. It certainly doesn't seem like it impacted Tavon Austin. D- does that Wonderlick thing, does that just depend on the position and in, in how much that's really taken into account? Well, the Wonder Lick, unfortunately, is just the only standardized test that we've got um, that you can go back years and years and years and, and, and parallel a player that was drafted, let's say, in 1992 with one that was drafted in 2013. I've seen a number of different uh, uh, tests that are given individually by clubs that kind of give them a better indication, but across all 32 teams, it's probably the best way for us to kind of standardize uh, uh, what is supposed to be giving you an indication of learning ability, cognitive thinking, that sort of thing. Um, in the end, yes, there are certain thresholds that you look for at various positions. Offensive tackle has theirs as compared to center, uh, safety as compared to defensive end. But in the end, I think what you try to do is you take that score and you couple it with sitting down with the individual and talking to him and maybe putting him through some, some drills on a whiteboard or just asking him some questions and, and how he thinks through and answers those questions. And if, if for the coach or the personnel evaluator the two line up, then great. If they don't, if the score is off from what you're hearing and vice versa, both good and bad, 
then it sends up an indicator that, hey, I need to get deeper into this part of the evaluation process. We're visiting with Ted Sundquist, who is an analyst for the NFL Network, former general manager of the Denver Broncos, has a, a very informative website you should spend some time on called thefootballeducator.com. We'll let Ted talk about it in just a moment. Also, we'll talk about his book coming out next month as well. Ted, how much did you take into account those workouts postseason? How, how much did you look at the production in college versus all the things after that? Some guys go to the senior bowl. Some guys have their pro day, the scouting combine, individual workouts. How did you balance those factors? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's easy to get caught up in the postseason uh, portion of it because the, the media gets involved, the pundits get in there, you start seeing all the mock drafts. You know, a lot of these guys that have got their mock drafts didn't really do the evaluation during the season. They catch on towards the end of the season, and then once the season's over, they start studying these players, and they get transfixed on uh, senior bowl workouts or, or, or a combine vertical jump or how a guy ran in his pro day. And the way that I always try to explain it to people is it's a thousand-piece puzzle, and you're trying to put it together to the to the degree that you are absolutely 100% sure that you're looking at an NFL wide receiver or an NFL linebacker. Now, if it's a you know five piece puzzle, really quickly you can put one in there and put one in there, and two pieces might show you, yeah, hey, I, I see a defensive end. But I feel much better when I've got multiple pieces put you know put together to to create that picture. That's just kind of an analogy that I use. That said. You can't weigh one over the other. I mean, ultimately, it's how does the how does the player uh, perform on the field? What does he do to help his football team win? And then, as you start piecing things together, how does this project to past players that have been successful at our level? And as I as I do that, do I see and am I putting together a picture of a player that I can project down the road to be successful in the offensive or defensive scheme that I'm using? So I'm not going to say that that they don't matter, but what you can't do is just suddenly say, well, this guy's jumping up the boards because he ran fast at his pro day. That's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way in the Titans' war room. I can promise you it didn't work that way in the Denver Broncos' war room. It's just part of the overall piece. And, And unfortunately, I think for the fans sometimes, you know, whatever we're looking at at that particular moment is the most important thing. And there's this sense of, well, golly, he broad jumped ten foot nine, so you know he went from the third to the second round. And <laughs> it just—you're not going to leap from the third to the second round on a ten foot nine broad jump. Let's put it that way. Well, Ted, within all those puzzle pieces you mentioned, there may be some sub pieces, perhaps, because when you're just looking at tape of guys, we've seen it with a lot of different guys, whether it's Matt Barkley or you can go on and on, guys that. Tyler Wilson at Arkansas, guys that were really good one year, say their junior year, and then had a drop off the senior year. How do you balance those two with all those different factors at play? Well, it's really important, I think, as the area scouts and then the the uh, regional scouts get in to that's their job is to get in there and talk to the coaches and get a feel for what happened. Why was there a drop off from the junior to the senior year, or maybe from the sophomore year to the junior year? You know, did a did a did a key player in that overall uh, scheme graduate and move on, and now he wasn't flanked by a player that was, you know, a big influence on how he was performing? Was there an injury that we didn't know about? Uh, did a coach happen to leave that was a big influence on his development and he was coming through and then a new coach came in? There are all kinds of various ripple effect factors that if you don't get to the bottom of them, Sometimes you look at the tape and just go, well, he's loafing or he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing or suddenly he's not running routes right. I mean, what's the, what's the deal here? And you can quickly make a wrong evaluation based on, you know, faulty information unless your scouts have gotten in there and really dug down and gotten to the bottom of what happened. And, and you're exactly right. That is a red flag for us. And normally uh, the, the proper thing to do is to actually turn to the scout that went into that school and the scout that went in and cross-check and say, hey, what are the coaches telling you? What did the trainer tell you there? You know, what did you see having watched him a little bit as a junior uh, in preparation uh, as you're going in there as senior year? What did you see that, that may have caused this? And so um, that is a, you know, that's a great question that you bring up, and it's something that we're very cognizant of when putting together the final, the final report. Uh, Ted, 
Earlier in the show, we were uh, having a debate about Tyler Bray, the Tennessee quarterback, goes undrafted. And, and the question I'm, to you is, in, in general, is that if you're going to be drafted in the seventh round, is it better off actually waiting and being a free agent and, and having more choice about what team you go to? Or is it better, you know, once you get to camp, is, is the team going to value that seventh round draft choice more than a free agent? What's What's the pros and cons of that scenario? Well, here, here's my answer to you. The, the pro would be, and this is, this is not a reason for it to be a pro, but, it, but in the end, it, I, I guess you've got to look at it that way, is he's going to get a little bit more sign-in bonus money than he would get as a college free agent. You know, some clubs will come at the uh, college free agents with 1,000, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000. Um, my philosophy was, is, hey, let's go get quality over quantity. And so we'd set, our, we'd set aside enough money to divvy up between maybe five of them that was just under what a seventh rounder would have made and just say, hey, we believe in you this much that we're willing to give you this guarantee and ask you to come in here and be a part of our team. Now, let's flip it around this way. As you look at two deep rosters in the NFL, there are three primary sources at every position where they come from. And believe it or not, it's first and second rounders and college free agents. And I think the reason is is this, exactly what you said. You and your agent then have the opportunity to put you in the best position possible to succeed. If you're drafted in the seventh round with a club that's already drafted a quarterback, let's say in the third round, and has an established starter, at best you're looking at number three. Um, and they've probably already got another guy in there at number three. But if you go undrafted, if you can just – if you can stomach the, 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 you know, the disappointment of not having been selected in the NFL draft, but understand that it doesn't matter if you're a college free agent or a first-rounder, your chances of making a two-deep are probably better on the outside of the sandwich than they, than they are on the inside sometimes. You can put, your, put yourself in a more advantageous uh, position by selecting the club that you go to. And so from a quarterback's perspective, I would say that's almost what you'd want to do. You, you wouldn't want to be drafted fifth, sixth, seventh, because history's going to show those guys usually don't ever make it up to the top. But, it, but, it, but as a, a free agent, you've got an opportunity to kind of, again, maximize that opportunity and put yourself with a team that really needs your services. Ted, how surprised were you that Tyler Bray was not drafted? I was very surprised, only because you know after you got past Geno Smith and um, and and DJ Emanuel, really it was kind of a grab bag of quarterbacks. I don't. It was either it was either Wilson or Glennon or Nassib or and you were hearing all of those guys as high as the second round and then falling down to the third or fourth round. And so to be honest with you, a player of you know of his stature, where he came from down there in the SEC, playing at Tennessee, throwing to those two dynamic receivers, so everybody had a chance to go in there and see him, and all the talk and all the uh, support that he was getting prior to the draft, I, I thought he would have at least been drafted at a minimum by the fourth round. We heard from Tyler Bray's dad that his phone was ringing off the hook for two hours. Uh, nonstop afterwards, and he wanted to be in KC with Andy Reid. Talk about that fit there with the quarterbacks that they have on their roster. Obviously, Alex Smith, Chase Daniel, Ricky Stanzi, Alex Tanney, and I think they're going to give a workout to uh, to Dan Chris too. What do you think about that fit with Kansas City? Well, I, I think right now it's kind of wide open. And the great thing is, is you know, certainly they went out and they they made an effort to get Alex Smith to come in and be their start, starter. But with a new regime, I know John Dorsey very well. Um, and there's none better when it comes to personnel evaluation. Uh, he was with Green Bay for a number of years and was a big part of their success in drafting players. He knows what he's looking for. Andy Reid has been there in Philadelphia with that offense up there for a number of years. He knows how to take care of quarterbacks. And so when a club like that is going after you, not only from the coaching standpoint but from the personnel side, I jump at the opportunity because I really truly feel past Alex Smith, it is a wide open competition for whoever is going to come in there and back him up. And so for Tyler to get an opportunity to go into Kansas City under a new regime with a fresh start on that football team, especially on the offensive side of the ball, um, I think they made a wise decision. 
Ted, last couple things with you. We really appreciate your time. We're visiting with Ted Sundquist, analyst for the NFL Network, former general manager of the Denver Broncos, spent 16 years in NFL management. Has a great website, thefootballeducator.com. Your thoughts on Justin Hunter going to the Tennessee Titans and then part two of that. How do you think the Titans did in the draft? Well, I'm excited for Justin because he's getting a chance to stay, you know, right in his own backyard there where he went to school. And certainly when you're picked with the 34th pick in the second round, you might, you could have easily been the 28th or the 17th pick. Sometimes it's just, it's, it's need at that particular point. I've drafted from the back end of that uh, first round for a number of years. And a lot of times versus going after the best player available, now you're looking at guys that, you know, you really feel like fit your knee. We did that with Al Wilson, a former Tennessee Vol, um, that some people probably thought, well, you know, he's a little small, not the type of guy we're looking for in the first round, but he ended up having a great career for us, was a leader of our defense. So when I look at a Justin Hunter, I could just as easily be talking right now about a first-round selection in, in my particular uh, um, evaluation of it. 6'4", 196 pounds, he's got nice length. Um, I, I like the way he attacks the football in the air and goes after it. You know, certainly I think Cordero with his big play ability kind of overshadowed Justin, but in the end, a lot of fans outside of Tennessee didn't realize that Justin was their leading receiver. Mm -hmm. So I think they've got a a good guy in there for locker and uh, a weapon that they're going to be able to develop over the years. And then overall, I think after that, they did a good job with just kind of addressing some areas of need. Again, Bleedy Ray Wilson, a lot of people thought really highly of in the early in the evaluation process. Uh, I like Brian Schwinke. Uh, I'm still close with Tom, Tommy Nalen, who you know played center for us out here on those Super Bowl teams, and this was his favorite player, bar none, in the draft on the offensive line. We talked about this a number of times, uh, the center out of Cal. So to get a guy like, like that in the fourth round, you know, it would not surprise me to look up here in a couple of years and Schwinke be you know, one of the best at the position and, and perhaps a Pro Bowl player. So... Uh, Tom also likes players with long hair, is what he told me. <laughs> that helped him out quite a bit as well. To, to tell people about your book coming out next month. Yeah, uh, Taking Your Team to the Top. It's my 16 years in the NFL. I also spent nine years in the United States Air Force. I'm an academy graduate, and I, I coached with Fisher to Barry there at Air Force and was an intelligence officer over in Berlin. And just kind of taking my, you know, experiences and the lessons that I've learned and putting together teams and, and, and what I feel like makes good teams tick and things that leaders need to think about. And I went out and I interviewed about 15, 16 people, not only in sports, uh, Coach Tom Osborne, former head coach at Nebraska, Fisher to Barry, Chad Hennings, three-time Super Bowl uh, champion with the Dallas Cowboys, but also in, in industry and in politics. Uh, in a number of different areas. Uh, Hart, Dr. Harvey Schiller, former uh, commissioner of the SEC a number of years ago, and kind of got their take on, on team building and, and the importance of uh, the various factors that I was talking about and how they use those. So it's an interesting read, I think, not only for sports fans, but also for just anyone who has to deal with uh, working with people and trying to, to reach goals in a, in a group. Great website as well. Spent some time on it. You can learn a lot about football from the uh, former general manager standpoint, thefootballeducator.com. Also, Ted, will interact with you on Twitter. It's one of the amazing things. A guy with your knowledge that uh, spends some time with fans asking questions. What do you think about this guy? How would you do this? At Ted underscore Sunquist, S-U-N-D-Q-U-I-S-T. Follow him on Twitter as well. He'll answer your questions. It's pretty amazing that you do that, Ted. Well, I appreciate it. I wish I had more than 140 characters. It's hard to talk cryptic with some of them, but that's why a lot of times if I've got a longer answer, I'll just shoot them towards the, uh, towards the website and yeah. kind of get a better feel for what I'm trying to describe there. But I uh, really appreciate you guys having me on today. Thanks, Ted. Look forward to having you on again. Appreciate it. All right, fellas. Take care. All right, that is Ted Sundquist. Wish we had more time with him. Incredibly informative. We'll hopefully get him back on the show, and we'll talk to him about some of the other balls and then talk to him about some other things from a GM standpoint and an excellent analyst for the NFL Network.